let me pull this up and share my screen. All right, so you guys should be able to see the PowerPoint now. Uh, we just have a few slides left to really cover, but I, I wanted to go back to this picture with the cardiac uh, cycle because this does give students some trouble. And I'm, the section in the book is a little complicated. Um, if you watched the video already from the last time when I covered this and you got it, that's great. Um, but I know there's going to be a few questions off of this on the test, and I just want you to be prepared for them. I need everybody to really know this area down here because this area, this whole box at the bottom represents the blood volume changes that occur in the ventricles. Of course, all of these tracings from the top to the bottom show what happens in the left ventricle, but all of the tracings would look exactly the same for the right ventricle. The only difference between the left and the right ventricle with regards to this chart are the number values of the pressure, which we're not memorizing anyway. So notice the pressure values up here, uh, 120 millimeters of mercury of pressure. This would be the highest pressure that's generated while the ventricles are contracting. We call that the systolic pressure. <clears throat> and we know this is the systolic pressure because it's happening within this purple area. The purple area is ventricular contraction or systole. So notice at the very top, the pressures get up to 120. And then down here, when the ventricles are relaxed, that the red line represents the aorta pressure. So when the ventricles go back down and are relaxing, the pressure in the aorta goes back down through relaxation and it's right around 80. So this is your textbook value, 120 over 80. This is the top number and this would be, you know, the bottom number which happens during ventricular relaxation. Now the right ventricle, all of these tracings, when the ventricular pressure goes up and down, and when aortic pressure goes up and down, would look the same on the right side, but the pressures are much lower. So it wouldn't, it, they never reach way up here, they're more down here. So we're not memorizing those pressures, but what's important about the pressure area, the pressure chart is knowing what happens when the, when the ventricular pressure goes up and then when it comes back down, which really brings us to these two areas in between these two lines, which is called isovolumetric contraction and isovolumetric relaxation between these two lines. So notice between isovolumetric contraction, these two lines, the ventricular pressure is going up. So when that ventricular pressure goes up, and the pressure in the ventricle rises just above the pressure that is in the aorta. The semilunar valves open. And when the semilunar valves open, we get what is called ventricular ejection. So we notice that the volume line starts to go down just at this second line right here. So at that second line right there, if you follow it all the way up, you can see how the blue line rises just above the red one. Now, of course, the red line is going to follow it because the pressure in the aorta goes up as the blood is entering it. So I know that the semilunar valves open right here at the end of isovolumetric contraction because the volume in the ventricle drops. And the only place the blood can go from a ventricle is into its artery. So I know the aorta is, is receiving blood from the left ventricle because ventricular volume is, is decreasing. Sorry about that, is decreasing. Now, if we go back up to the pressure chart, we see that ventricular pressure starts to fall. And that's because the ventricles have completed its contraction phase at this point. So all the, pur the purple ends at this line. So from this line forward, the ventricles are in relaxation. So when the ventricles begin to relax, the pressure starts to fall. And as soon as the ventricular pressure, the blue line, drops below atrial pressure, which is the green line, I know at this point right there, 
that the AV valves open. The AV valves are going to open here, and I know that because the ventricles fill with blood and the volume goes up. So the only place that ventricles get blood from are their atria. So I know before the blood can go from an atrium to a ventricle that the AV valve has to open. So as soon as the AV valves open right here, we get what's called ventricular filling. So the two most important areas of our cardiac cycle with respect to blood moving is the isovolumetric contraction phase, which is embedded in ventricular systole. That's why it's colored purple and isovolumetric relaxation, which begins when the ventricles begin to relax. So in these two areas, at the end of them, some valves are gonna open, and that's what's important. The semilunar valves open at the end of isovolumetric contraction. The AV valves open at the end of isovolumetric relaxation. So we know then when, when valves open in the heart, blood is gonna move somewhere. So blood always moves from high to low pressure. Um, when the semilunar valves open, you know the ventricles eject their blood into their artery, and that's why we see a drop here in volume. And when the AV valves open, we know the ventricles receive blood from the atria. All right, so those are important. The other two values on here that are pretty important are uh, the volume of blood that's in the ventricle just prior to ventricular systole. So basically at the end of ventricular diastole, that volume of blood is important. It's called the EDV. And also the volume of blood that is left in the ventricle after the ventricle completes it con its contraction phase. Not all of the blood is ejected out. There's some that's left in there. So the blood that is left in the ventricle at the end of ventricular systole is called the end systolic volume. So if you subtract the EDV from the ESV, you then know how much blood volume was ejected out of the ventricle on that one beat. And that's called the stroke volume. And so this is where we ended up last time with me just covering what cardiac output is and then talking about stroke volume a little bit with heart rate. So cardiac output is a diagnostic measurement of the effectiveness of your heart. How efficient is your heart? So it is a measurement of the volume of blood, milliliters, that is pumped out of or ejected out of the ventricles into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk every minute. So cardiac output is volume of blood per minute that's being pumped out of the heart. So cardiac output is dependent upon these two things. How much blood your heart, your ventricles pump out on each beat, which is the stroke volume, and how many times a minute your heart beats. So obviously it's a pretty simple calculation. If you know stroke volume and heart rate, you just multiply them and you get cardiac output. So anything that makes your stroke volume go up would make your cardiac output go up and vice versa. Anything, that, if your heart rate goes up, your cardiac output is going to go up. So let's go over those parameters and talk about them again. I may have talked about these already. If not, uh, if I did, we'll just uh, review them again. Um, there are three factors that affect stroke volume. Something called preload, which is the degree to which the wall of a ventricle is being stretched. In other words, how stretched is the wall of a ventricle? That's called the preload. If we can put more blood into a ventricle, the ventricular myocardium, the wall, will stretch more, in which case, when it goes to contract, it snaps back harder on itself to contract harder to eject more blood out. So if we can increase the preload, we would increase the stroke volume. That's what I mean to say by that. And we're going to go over some of these things in a second. And then we have the contractility of the heart, how forceful are the ventricles contracting? Can they increase their force of contraction with certain hormones or neurotransmitters or even medications? And if we can increase the force of contraction, that causes the stroke volume to go up. 
Now, the afterload is something that our body can't control physiologically. The afterload basically is the bottom number of your blood pressure, which is the pressure, the afterload is the pressure that the ventricles have to generate or overcome before the semilunar valves can open. So let's say here's aortic pressure on my chart again, if we go back. So the aortic pressure, the bottom numbers around, around 80 on this chart. So the pressure in the lower, in the ventricle has to rise above the pressure that's in its artery before the semilunar valve can open and thus blood will be ejected out. So if this number is higher than normal, let's say it's not 80, let's say it was up here at 100, which is really bad. You see how much higher that is? The ventricles would have to work even harder to make that blue line go up that much further before the semilunar valves will open and blood will be ejected out. So that lower, that bottom number is the afterload and if, which is hypertension. And during hypertension, the heart has to generate more force to eject blood out. And over a long period of time, it damages the heart and it damages our blood vessels. And that's why hypertension is what they call the silent killer. I mean, you feel okay. You really can't feel it, but the damage is occurring in there. So the only way that we can affect the afterload is by changing our lifestyle. If you eat correctly, eat good food, you exercise, um, you might even go to the doctor and take hypertensive medications. That can all lower your, your pressure. So if we, can, if we can lower the afterload, that would cause your cardiac output to go up because you would have more time for ventricular ejection to occur, right? So if the at, which would make the stroke volume go up. If you drop the afterload, the stroke volume can go up. If the afterload goes up, that can have an adverse effect on the stroke volume and make the stroke volume initially go down. So typically people with high blood pressure may have, not always, but may have higher heart rates at rest than other individuals. All right, so we're gonna talk about that again in a minute. Let's talk about the other factor that affects cardiac output, which is heart rate. So heart rate, as you know, is the number of times your heart beats and there are several different things that can change uh, how fast or how slow the heart is beating. The autonomic nervous system and hormones in our body are the two main systems that our body utilizes to control our heart rate. So for instance, right now we're just sitting down. We're not physically active. We have what's called our low resting heart rate. The reason why our heart rate is, is slower when we're resting and not physically active is because the parasympathetic nervous system of the autonomic nervous system fires when you're resting and the parasympathetic nervous system slows your heart rate down. On the other hand, if you get up and you're physically active, your sympathetic nervous system from the autonomic system fires and that speeds your heart rate up. And then certain hormones around the body, thyroid hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, all of these can also increase your heart rate. Certain ion concentration changes can affect heart rate slightly, in particular calcium. I'm going to show you that on the chart in a minute. But if we can increase the number of calcium ions on the outside of the heart, cardiac muscle cell, that can make our heart rate go up a little bit. So these first three bullets are things that can alter physiologically control our heart rate. The last ones down here, we don't control. For instance, our heart rates change as we get, as we age. Babies have faster heart rates. As we get older, our heart rates kind of tend to get slower, but not in everybody. It depends on their health. You know, uh, what the types of foods they eat or do they do drugs, drink alcohol, different things can change that. But typically, at when we're younger, the heart rates are higher than when we're older. Also, gender affects heart rate. Typically, females have a higher heart rate than males do at rest. I'm talking about at rest. Um, but it's not 100% across the board. There are some females that have lower heart rates than the, their male counterpart. But that's just in general. 
And then obviously physical fitness. Runners and aerobic athletes tend to have lower resting heart rates than anyone, which means that, that, that their heart is very efficient. If your heart can pump out your total blood volume in one minute with beating less times per minute, that means your heart is more efficient. Because at rest, our heart has to pump out our total blood volume in one minute. So let's say, you know, I'm sitting, I'm not a, an avid runner. I used to be, but I'm not anymore. But I'm sitting down. My heart rate might be 70, 75. If you have a marathon runner who is actively training and, you know, anybody else like that, you don't have to run marathon, but very in shape, their resting heart rate can get down to 55 or 60. And so a trained athlete, or a person that works out all the time and is healthy, their heart can beat less times per minute, but pump the same volume of blood. So how can that be? Well, it means that their stroke volumes are higher. And the person who has to have a higher heart rate to pump their total volume of blood at rest means that their stroke volumes are lower. So, a trained athlete has higher stroke volumes because their heart contracts more forcefully because it's trained. Um, also temperature. As our body temperature goes up, your heart rate goes up. And that's typically due to the fact that uh, with increased body temperature, your sympathetic nervous system fires. That's why I don't, I don't know if you ever noticed, but when you're sick, if you have a fever, if you ever take your pulse, your, your heart rate is kind of fast. That's because your temperature's high, right? So we're gonna look at all these factors on the summary chart in a second, but let's go back over um, the inputs and the outputs from the cardiovascular center. So everything that you see in blue are sensory inputs to the control center of the cardiovascular center, which is called the CV center. It's located in the medulla oblongata. And here is where all of the information is analyzed about what's going on with your body. And then, depending on what's going on, the control center will then determine what type of motor output is required to keep you healthy. So the types of motor output that come from the cardiovascular center are either sympathetic, from the sympathetic nervous system, or parasympathetic, and it works this way. Let's say, well, you have to know what these receptors do, so let's go over them one at a time. The proprioceptors are receptors in and around all the joints of your body, in your arms, your legs, everywhere you can think of a joint that you learned in AMP1. So these receptors constantly monitor the movements of your arms and legs, and if, if you're physically active, this is how your brain knows when you're physically active. It, from these receptors. So let's say you're lying down on the couch. Obviously you're not moving. So these receptors, the proprio receptors, send information to the control center saying, hey, we're lying down. We don't need a whole bunch of blood going to our muscles. So the control center says, yep, they're not physically active. So what type of output do we get from there? Parasympathetic output. Parasympathetic output slows down your heart rate. And if you slow down your heart rate, it decreases your cardiac output, which decreases your blood pressure and decreases blood flow, which is okay because if you're lying down, your body doesn't have a high demand for that blood. But what happens when you get up off that couch and you go to the gym and you start running on a treadmill? Everything changes. You start being physically active, obviously your muscles need more blood flow. So what did appropriate receptors say then? They send information to the CV center saying, hey, we're running on a treadmill, we need more blood going to our muscles. So how do we increase blood flow to Um, I think you cut out. Did he cut out for y'all too, or is it just me? I think he was. No, he, he cut out for me as well. I don't, I don't, I don't see him on my phone at all. 
He might have lost he, internet. He must have froze up. You know, it's, it kicks him out. Yeah, it kicks him out every now and then. Um, he better get back on in like probably uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Damn, the whole thing went away. Trump's the Can you all hear me now? Yeah, it cut out. Yeah. Yeah, no, my, yes, sir. I had to move my internet line. All right, let me see if we're still, let me share again, hold on. It kind of bites. All right, somebody tell me where you where where I cut out at so I can start over. Um, I think you cut out. Did y'all hear the stuff about the output from the CV center? Yeah, I think you stopped at um, if somebody gets up off the couch and oh, good. goes towards the gym. Yeah. Very good. Let's pick up there. All right. So you got the little scenario if you're lying down on the couch, right? And so we don't need to have a, a large cardiac output. If you're lying down, you get parasympathetic output because the proprioceptors are telling the CV center that you're not moving. But when you run, go to the gym and you start being physically active, the proprioceptors tell the CV center, hey, we're physically active. Our muscles need more blood. So we get sympathetic output. So we have these cardiac accelerator nerves, which are sympathetic in nature, which means they dump out norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter, and they dump out norepinephrine on the pacemaker, the SA and the AV nodes. That's going to increase your heart rate. And they dump out norepinephrine on the ventricular myocardial cells, the contractile fibers. And when you dump out norepinephrine from a nerve or you're receiving epinephrine, the hormone from the adrenal gland, your uh, contractile fibers are gonna contract harder. So basically adrenaline and noradrenaline increases heart rate and the force of contraction. And if you increase the force of contraction, you increase stroke volume. So this is all about what needs to happen with the heart. Do we need to increase cardiac output and pressure, in, blood pressure and blood flow? And if you do, we want sympathetic output. If we can decrease our blood flow because we're inactive, then we want parasympathetic output. Now, parasympathetic output releases acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter and acetylcholine is inhibitory on the pacemaker. So that's why your heart rate goes down when you're resting because the parasympathetic nervous system is dumping out acetylcholine on your pacemaker, right? All right, so that's, the, that's called proprioception, by the way. Our brain knows if we're moving or not. Chemoreception comes from the chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptors monitor your blood chemistry, specifically, how much oxygen is in the blood, um, how much CO2 is in the blood, and what the blood pH is. So uh, the level of the gases that are in your blood are called the partial pressure. So we abbreviate that something like P, P as in Paul, PO2 would be partial pressure of oxygen, or PCO2 is the partial pressure of CO2. So let's say you're lying on the couch, what should the blood chemistry be? Well, your oxygen probably will be okay, you know, because your muscles aren't demanding a lot of oxygen. They take out the little bit they need, but even what we call deoxygenated blood is still saturated at 75% with oxygen at rest, if you're, if you're resting. So the blood still has some oxygen in it. Yeah, they got some CO2 in it because the cells are dumping CO2 out, but it's not all that elevated because 
they're not metabolically active. Uh, and the pH is going to be normal unless something else is going on. Let's say in a healthy individual. So your pH of your blood is maintained between 7.35 and 7.45. So your blood pH will be normal. However, and that's when you're just lying down. So if the blood chemistry says that you're not active, meaning your pH is normal, O2 is normal, and CO2 is normal, then the CV center says, yep, they're not active, so we get parasympathetic output. However, if you start becoming physically active, your muscles are working harder than they normally do, they all metabolically active tissues produce acids as waste products. So the blood pH, at least locally, in and around the area where the tissue is active, starts to become a little acidic. Now, the, the pH can drop a little bit globally. We'll talk about that later. It's beyond the scope of this particular lecture. But ultimately, your pH drops just a little bit, becomes a little more acidic when you're working out. Everybody knows you make lactic acid when your muscles work out. I think you heard of that before. But there's, there's several other things that drop your pH. So let's say you're working out, the pH would drop. And if you're working out, your muscles are taking a lot more oxygen out of the blood. So your oxygen level will initially drop a little bit. And since they're working out, they're making a lot more ATP aerobically. They need ATP to do their work. And the byproduct of ATP production aerobically is water and carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide gets dumped into the blood. So in the workout scenario, the blood chemistry would change this way. O2 would go down. CO2 would go up and your pH would go down a little bit. So in that scenario, the CV center says, yep, we don't have enough oxygen. We have a little bit too much CO2 and we're a little acidic. So what do we need to do? We need to increase cardiac output to increase blood pressure and blood flow around the body so that our muscles can get what they need. We can also send more blood faster to the lungs to get more oxygen faster and to get rid of CO2 faster which is a conversation for the respiratory system. But your respiratory system and your cardiovascular system act hand in hand. I just have to teach them separate because it's in two separate chapters. But you also, as you know, when you're running on a treadmill, you start breathing faster and deeper. That's because of the resp respiratory centers, which are also located in the brainstem, not exactly with this one, but in the brainstem, and it causes you to breathe more. So you get rid of CO2, you get rid of... Uh, uh, you get rid of CO2 and you get more oxygen in. The baroreceptors monitor your blood pressure directly. Um, we're going to go over the blood pressure sensitive reflexes in chapter 21, uh, which we're going to start on Thursday. Um, and those uh, pressure sensitive reflexes are controlled by baroreceptors and the cardiovascular center. So here's how they work in a nutshell. The baroreceptors are basically stretch receptors in the wall of an artery. They're located in the arch of the aorta. They're located in uh, uh, the carotid sinus, which is the base of the carotid artery where it splits. Um, and so these areas have receptors that are sensitive to pressure in the artery. So let's say the pressure to the brain starts to fall. I'm going to give you a real example real quick. Let's say the pressure to the brain starts to fall just a little bit because you got up from a lying down position really quickly. I'm sure everybody's experienced this. You get up real quick, you get kind of dizzy and lightheaded. That's called, by the way, orthostatic hypotension. It's a hypotensive state that's induced by a change in body position that's caused by the force of gravity. So if you stand up real quick, gravity is going to pull the blood down your carotid arteries or, or they won't go up to the brain like you were when you were lying down. So the amount of blood that gets to the brain starts to drop just a little bit. And if you're healthy, the, this reflex kicks in very quickly to restore blood pressure to the brain. So the baroreceptors in a carotid sinus say, hey, to the CV center, blood pressure to the brain just fell a little bit because we stood up. Well, the CV center says, yep, blood pressure to the brain fell a little bit. We better increase blood pressure to the brain. So what do we need to do to increase pressure? Oh, we have to increase cardiac output. So how do we increase cardiac output? 
sympathetic stimulation to the heart. So we get sympathetic stimulation to the pacemaker. So your heart rate goes up. You get sympathetic stimulation to the ventricular myocardium. So contractility goes up, which makes stroke volume go up. So you're increasing both parameters that increase cardiac output. And there, thereby, you increase pressure and blood flow to the brain, and then you feel normal again. So I'm sure everybody kind of felt dizzy at one point if you stand up too quickly. Um, that's called hy orthostatic hypotension. And so this is the reflex that uh, is initiated in order to bring your pressure back to normal. All right, so let's go over our summary chart. All right, and then I'm going to show you my summary chart, and then I'm going to field some questions from you to see if you have any questions or what your understanding of this is. So this is a summary chart for cardiac output. The parameters that directly affect cardiac output are stroke volume and heart rate. You need to know what parameters affect each one of these and thus how it affects cardiac output. Same thing with heart rate, all right, down here. So let's start with stroke volume. First of all, anything that makes stroke volume go up and or heart rate go up makes your cardiac output go up. So in your little picture that you see over here, two people running, they would want a higher cardiac output while you're running than if they were just sitting down somewhere because they're being physically active. So what happens when you're physically active? Well, when we're physically active, we, we increase the volume of blood that gets to a ventricle just prior to ventricular contraction. So that's called the end diastolic volume. So everybody see that end diastolic volume? I'm gonna go back up to this cardiac cycle and here it is right here. That's our end diastolic volume. So just before the ventricles go to contract, the volume of blood that's in the ventricle is very important. Once the ventricles begin to contract, you can't put any more blood into them. So the only volume of blood that the ventricles have available to be pumped out is the EDV. So what is the EDV? Is it lower? Is it higher? The EDV can change. When you're lying down on the couch, your EDV is whatever your normal level of EDV would be, which is somewhere around 130 mils on average. That can go up or down a little bit depending on your body size and your heart size. So when you're physically active though, this EDV is going to go up, and which means the ventricle starts with more blood. And that's important because if you put more blood in the ventricle, it stretches it. And if the ventricle is more stretched, you've increased the preload. If you increase the preload, the heart contracts more forcefully and it ejects more blood out. Just like if someone's lifting weights, a stronger guy can lift more weight, right? Or a girl, I don't wanna, you know, exclude them. So if you're stronger, you can lift more weight. Well, if your heart contracts harder, you're gonna eject more blood out. So if you can increase the EDV, you're going to increase the stretch, which is the preload, which increases contraction force, which increases stroke volume and cardiac output. So this is a big one. This one is the one that happens very quickly in our body, along with, with, with con contractility with the positive and negative inotropes as well. But these two up here are the ones that will definitely control our stroke volume to control cardiac output. All right, and I'm gonna talk about how we increase this EDV in a second. But let's get to contractility. Contractility is the forcefulness of contraction. If the ventricles increase contraction force, they eject more blood out, which means you've increased stroke volume. If the contraction force goes down, you eject less blood out and the stroke volume goes down. So there are chemical agents that can cause the ventricles to contract harder or softer than they normally do. Any chemical agent that can increase the force of contraction of the ventricle is called a positive inotropic agent. 
So positive inotropic agents, if I lose you in this talk, do this one thing. They increase the force of contraction, which increases stroke volume, which increases cardiac output. So more often than not, positive inotropic agents increase contractility by increasing how much calcium gets to the inside of the cardiac muscle cell. So I don't have time to go back over what we learned in AMP1 about calcium being the trigger for contraction and all that. Maybe you do remember that. But in a cardiac muscle cell, cal the majority of the calcium that gets into the cell comes from the outside of the cell. So any chemical agent that can open up calcium channels at the cell surface and allow more calcium to get to the inside of the cardiac muscle cell, which is called the intracellular calcium load. Anything that can increase the intracellular calcium load would be a positive inotrope. So what can increase how much calcium gets to the inside of the cell and or affect contractility directly? Because some affect contractility directly. All right, so let me go through some of these. Sympathetic stimulation, we've already talked about that off of this chart. Sympathetic stimulation increases heart rate. Sympathetic stimulation increases contractility. Well, how does that happen? Because the sympathetic stimulation releases catecholamines. The catecholamines is a fancy name for epinephrine and norepinephrine. So epinephrine and norepinephrine, the catecholamines, either from the sympathetic nervous system or from the adrenal medulla, bind to adrenergic receptors on the heart and increases heart rate and increases the force of contraction. The adrenergic receptors that they bind to on the ventricular myocardium basically opens calcium channels. So you get more calcium influx to the cell, the cell contracts harder, and your stroke volume goes up, right? Now, up in the list, you see glucagon. You learned about that from the pancreas in chapter 18, uh, affecting blood sugar. Well, one of its minor roles is to affect our heart, along with thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormones, one of its main jobs in the body is to affect your metabolic rate. How well do you make ATP utilizing fuel sources? But it also affects our heart because thyroid hormone acts in a permissive way on the heart to allow the catecholamines to be more effective on contractility. Basically, thyroid hormones increases the number of receptors on the ventricular myocardial cell, which makes the cell more sensi sensitive to the catecholamines. So, Sympathetic stimulation, catecholamines, glucagon, thyroid hormone, and even increases in extracellular calcium can all increase the force of contraction. Oh, for that reason, some of y'all might already know this if you work in like the ER or something. You know on the crash cart, somebody's crashing, they have calcium chloride on the crash cart. You can juice somebody up with calcium chloride, which increases calcium loads in their blood, which gets around the heart. And if you increase the amount of calcium on the outside of the cell, when the channel opens, more calcium is going to flow in, which can help increase their contraction. So all of those are called positive inotropic agents. They increase contractility to increase stroke volume. Now over here, the afterload, which what I was mentioning before, we can't control this one physiologically. This is just the bottom number of your blood pressure. You have to change your lifestyle, work out, eat right, maybe take hypertensive meds. But if you could decrease this, your stroke volume would go up. However, if afterload increases, your stroke volume would go down. So that's how afterload affects it. All right. So the afterload is that pressure again. Remember that the ventricles have to generate before the semilunar valves will open and thus ventricular ejection can occur. So if the pressure is higher, it takes longer to open the valve, in other words. If the pressure is lower, the valve opens sooner and you eject more blood out. Now down here for heart rate, 
Heart rate is primarily affected by adrenaline and noradrenaline, epinephrine, nor norepinephrine, or the catecholamines from the adrenal medulla and the, the autonomic nervous system. So if you're lying down on the couch, we would want parasympathetic output. Parasympathetic output releases acetylcholine on the pacemaker and your heart rate goes down and cardiac output would go down. So while you're sitting down or lying down, you have your low resting cardiac output. However, now you see the people running. What happens when you're active? Well, we get sympathetic output. Sympathetic output releases basically norepinephrine. They use the sympathetic uh, postganglionic neurons use norepinephrine as their neurotransmitter. So just like norepinephrine or epinephrine the catecholamines from the adrenal medulla increase heart rate. So does norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate to increase cardiac output. Now we do have some chemicals that can affect heart rate other than just a sympathetic stimulation or parasympathetic stimulation. And I know they don't have it here, but I'm going to show you one last chart before I field your questions. Um, any chemical agent that can increase or decrease heart rate would be called a chronotropic agent. So any, any agent that increases heart rate would be called a positive chronotropic agent. Do you guys know what the prefix chrono means? It means time. Like a chronograph is a particular type of watch which tells time. So positive chronotropic agents increase heart rate, negative chronotropic agents decrease heart rate. So here are some positive ones. The catecholamines, which we covered already up here for contractility still affect heart rate. So that would be con considered positive chronotropic. Thyroid hormones to a small degree are positive chronotropes. And then moderate increases in extracellular calcium affects your heart rate as well but the effect on stroke volume is more drastic with calcium, extracellular calcium than heart rate, but it still goes up a little bit from that, all right? So the last thing down here for heart rate are all the factors that we can't control physiologically again, just like afterload, we don't physiologically control that. So what are those other factors? Well, what stage of your life are you in? Infants have higher heart rates than senior citizens, females, you know, uh, a little bit lower, uh, I mean, a little bit higher than males, physical fitness, right? All of that, um, your body temperature. So we can't control these. So the ones I'm interested in are the ones that we can physiologically regulate. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so let me pull this back up. I need to stop sharing this for a second. Let's see. Pull this up real quick and reshare the screen. All right, can everybody see my screen now? The new, very good, Leslie gave me a thumbs up. All right, so here is the cardiac output concept map that I generated for my notes. It has the same stuff on it, but I just put a little bit more detail in it. So this probably would be a little bit better to study from than that the one we just went over, but you can look at both of them. The other one is kind of colored and all of that. <clears throat> so this concept map is a concept map for all of the different changes. You see the up arrows mean increase, a down arrow would mean decrease. So this concept map would be for an increase in cardiac output. So let's start over here for the parameters of stroke volume. All right, so on the other one, I just said, if we can increase the EDV, we increase the preload, which would increase the force of contraction to increase stroke volume, which increases cardiac output. So what I didn't mention is how do we increase the EDV? How does that EDV go up? Well, when you are physically active, you increase venous return. Venous return is the, is the volume of blood that returns back to your heart every minute. It's called venous return. And it's returning to the heart via veins. That's why it's called venous return. Now, when you're physically active, your muscles squeeze on the veins, which have valves in them. 
And when your muscles are squeezing on the veins, it squishes the blood back to the heart more quickly than if you're just lying down on the couch. So if you can return the blood back to the heart more quickly, you're returning more blood volume, which can get into a ventricle, which is the EDV. And again, if you increase the EDV, you increase the stretch, which is the preload, which increases contraction force to increase stroke volume. Now, um, as a clinician, when you become a nurse later on or whatever you're gonna be, you might see people who are dehydrated. That's gonna be fairly common. The first thing you do with someone that's moderately, even to severely dehydrated or someone that has lost blood, obviously if they have a wound, you gotta stop the bleeding, but the first thing you need to do is replenish fluid because with severe dehydration or even blood loss, a person is dying because their blood pressure is falling drastically. So what controls that blood pressure? How much blood volume the heart pumps out every minute in part. So in order to try and increase someone's pressure, we have to try and increase their cardiac output. But what affects cardiac output? Oh, stroke volume. We need to try and get your patient's stroke volume higher than what it is. How do we do that? Oh, we got to increase a stretch on the ventricle so it contracts harder. Well, how do we do that? You have to increase the EDV. Well, what increases the EDV? Venous return. And so how do we increase venous return in somebody that's dehydrated? You increase their blood volume. You hang an IV bag on them. You infiltrate more fluid into them, into the system, and by the sheer nature of you putting fluid in the vessels, you are allowing more volume to reach the heart, which is the EDV. That's why you put that bag on them. Now, someone that's bleeding out from a gunshot wound or something, you know, the doctor has to clean all it up and stop the bleeding, and then you have to put blood back into their body, along with IV fluids. So all of that would still increase blood volume. So anything that can increase blood volume increases venous return, which increases the EDV to increase the preload, increases contraction force and stroke volume, right? Now, ventricular diastole is the period of time that the ventricles are in relaxation. So if you remember, you can only fill the ventricle when it's relaxed. And if if you can increase the length of time that the ventricles are relaxing, you can increase the filling time. This is where the trained athletes come into play. A trained athlete has a lower heart rate at rest than say an average individual, but yet their heart still pumps out their total blood volume in one minute. So how is that possible to have a lower heart rate, right? It's because their stroke volumes are higher. Well, why is that? because their hearts are conditioned. They have longer ventricular diastole times. So their, the length of time that their ventricles are relaxed is a little bit longer. So their ventricle can fill more with blood, which is an increase in the EDV. You increase that EDV, you're gonna increase the preload, the stretch, which increases contraction force to increase stroke volume. So this is exactly why a trained athlete has a higher stroke volume at rest than an average individual. And if, you're, if your stroke volumes are higher at rest, that means your heart rate can be lower and your cardiac output can still be sufficient. If, however, your stroke volumes are lower, your heart rate has to compensate, it has to go up. Because remember, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. All right, now, uh, just the other two things on here that are important. Uh, I listed some important positive inotropic agents. Remember, positive inotropes are any agent that can increase calcium loads on the inside of the, of the contractile fiber, the myocardial contra uh, contractile fiber, which increases contractility. So if we can increase that calcium, we're going to increase contraction force. So all of these agents in some form or fashion increases contraction force, in particular, uh, typically by manipulating calcium. Uh, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, we talked about epinephrine and norepinephrine, dopamine acts along with epinephrine and norepinephrine. Glucagon and thyroid hormones are acting on the heart to help increase really two things, calcium loads and thyroid hormones increases the sensitivity uh, 
of the ventricles to epinephrine and norepinephrine. So thyroid hormone really works with the catecholamines. Now you may or may not know what digitalis is. This is a plant toxin, by the way. It's a drug given in the hospital. You ever heard of it? Digoxin? No, it's a cardiac med. So you have a patient who has a failing heart, their cardiac output is low, you might be ordered to give them digitalis. Digitalis blocks the removal of calcium from the cardiac muscle cell. So as calcium goes into the cell, it can increase in concentration. And what digitalis does, without me telling you exactly what channel it affects, because I know your brain's hurting, it blocks calcium from leaving the cell. So you pump, cal you're getting calcium to go in, but digitalis prevents it from leaving. And so if you increase calcium loads on the inside of the cell, you increase contractility. So that's why digoxin, that drug, which is a plant poison, helps increase stroke volume and cardiac output. Now the afterload, again, we can't control that, but if we could decrease it with exercise and eating right and medications, then your stroke volume would go up. Now down here for heart rate, just know sympathetic, parasympathetic, again, but since this is to try and increase cardiac output, I only put sympathetic stimulation, which increases heart rate and thus cardiac output. Um, the chronotropic agents that I put down here are some that obviously we know already that affects uh, contractility as well, epinephrine and dopamine. Well, they also have an effect on our heart rate. And that's why, you know, if you give somebody epinephrine, their heart rate's going to go up. That's why I like, well, if you go to the dentist and they give you the shot, that shot that they give you um, has epinephrine in it. I don't know if y'all know why epinephrine is in that shot that kind of numbs you. Uh, epinephrine is in that shot because epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor with the surface blood vessels. So it makes you bleed less when the doctor is drilling in your tooth. But they always say, do you have a heart problem or something? Because you're about to receive some epinephrine and epinephrine makes your heart rate go up. Um, isoproterenol is another drug that you may give. This is going to help increase cardiac output in people. This is uh, a drug that mimics epinephrine and, and norepinephrine on the heart. So it actually binds to the same receptors that epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to and helps increase cardiac output in your patient. And then if you increase calcium loads on the outside of the cell, more calcium can get into the cell as the channels open. And so that's why moderate increases in extracellular calcium can make your heart rate go up a little bit. All right, so this is, the, is my concept map. I want you to know what happens when things increase and decrease uh, that affects cardiac output. All right. All right. So before I stop sharing my screen, does anybody have any questions about this, this concept, Matt? Can you all still hear me? Oh, very good. I got a thumbs up. Yeah. All right. So I can stop sharing this screen. Hey, look, somebody knows how to put in a, a thumbs up on their little box. How do you do that? Huh. That's kind of cool. Somebody got a, put a little thumbs up over there. I just saw it. Oh, somebody's clapping. <laughs> Y'all are more savvy with this than I am. All right, let me uh, stop sharing this to pull this back up. All right, so the gist of today's lecture is to really understand all of the parameters when they increase or decrease, what's increasing, what's decreasing, and how it affects cardiac output. There's going to be several questions on that because that's a big part of the physiology from this chapter. And the reason why I stress that part of the chapter is because you're actually going to be getting some information that corresponds to this a couple of times this semester. And when you become a nurse or a clinician or whatever, this, this becomes full circle sooner or later with other systems in our body, like your kidneys and controlling acid base balance, your respiratory system, all, everything has to work together in some form or fashion. So, um, do, you, do you have any questions about any of that that I covered? Did it make sense? What goes up, what goes down and all of that? All right, well, if you don't have any questions, you're, you're free to leave the meeting. Um, as soon as I end the meeting, I will post this video when Zoom emails it to me like I did the other ones. Um.
Yeah, and, and good luck studying, all right? So you have, you know, just take the time, some time through the rest of today and study, unless you have to work tonight, then that's, that's a problem. But um, you can spend the rest of today studying. You have plenty of time. It's only 1030. And just review your hormones that we covered in Chapter 18. Review your cardiac cycle and your cardiac output. What is the blood flow through the heart? What receives blood from the right ventricle? What receives blood from the left ventricle? Where is blood moving from and going to through the heart is important. Um, so just take some time. Don't get discouraged one little thing at a time. Just review it. And then sometime tonight, I would say, I don't know, you know, 9, 9.30. I don't know how early you go to bed if you got to wake up early. Or, you know, just take it later on. Unless you got to work, you got to take it before, you know, you go to work. That's a problem. But all right. So I'm going to stop recording since nobody has any questions.